So, okay. You anyway, we will start. start. Yeah, will and we will start from the middle, in this case, um, from interaction. Um, uh, I was supposed in the beginning, in my introduction, to speak about generic idea or concept of creativity, uh, which is taken by granted as the only one existing in our secular world and promoted by global grand institutions. But uh, we would start with something else. I would ask you to think of three key words, and if any key words is not enough, then phrases of creativity. Please don't be politically, religiously correct or in an, any other way. Yeah, and don't take it too seriously. It is kind of brainstorming, a yeah, very quick one. And the second thing, I would ask you to find three key words spontaneously, as much spontaneously as you can after all the days of the conference, to think of a human, who <coughs> human or what human is, who potentially can create uh, I thought that I would um, I would provide you by paper and pens. Nothing can no, be like that. That's easier. <laughs> this is more <laughs> difficult. <laughs> paper and pens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, <laughs> because I want you to draw a little picture without any critical or judgmental take on the drawing. So the image on the conference program is the perfect one for human. So, yeah. Could you make a simple picture of a human and surroundings, environment around, and where, according to your intuition or sense or idea, creativity lives? Is it in human's brain, heart, inside, outside, whatever? And we don't mark the assignments. We don't do marking here. And there is no right or wrong answer. I don't know the answer, by the way. The third one. Yeah. So uh, could you please make a very simple image of a human, like that one which we can see on the program, conference program, and somehow mark surroundings or environment of it, and mark where creativity lives, inside of human, outside, in his or her brain, heart, or around, or no, something about situation of creativity. And Irina promised to give the papers. Papers here, the pencils are here. Yes, they're here. Uh, would you like a paper? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the task to draw a creative uh, human? Yeah. First task is uh, three words defining creative. Okay, let's Can you repeat? So, uh, three key words or phrases on creativity. Like yes. spontaneous, very spontaneous take on it without any judgmental, uh, critical approach. And three words on human who oh, can potentially, yeah, yeah. Because behind the idea of creativity is always an idea of what or who, what human is. That's a very important point. Yeah. And the third one, a very simple, like childlike picture of human environment and a, a place of creativity, inside, outside, in between, heart, brain, whatever, whatever you think or rather feel about that. Uh, 
Кому-то нужно на русском пояснять. Кто-то есть русскоязычный? Нужно на русском. Окей. Okay. I will pro provide you. I will provide Russian translation for you. Keywords or phrases, yeah, whatever you, is uh, enough for you. If keyword is not enough, you can use a phrase. I'm a little bit afraid that you, you overuse your artistic qualities. So. <laughs> A special pleasure to make teachers to draw or to yeah, fulfill some tasks. Are teachers harder to teach? Yeah. So tell me when you are ready and I'm ready. Mm -hmm. So, shall we? Uh, shall we go on with, yeah, um, if you are ready. Actually, for me, creativity is such a commonplace, uh, almost cliche if you start to read academic, non-academic uh, publications and absolutely numerous uh, journals which have this notion in their title. And if you check the annual reports of international, global international organizations like the World Bank annual report, United Nations or European, European Union offices <coughs> and uh, newly formed uh, bodies or establishments uh, backed by the Wall Street. So if you see there or any papers connected to development and uh, cultural practices or economic strategies, the notion will be repeated countless times and even more uh, in psychological literature uh, what we should be in our contemporary world uh, and amazingly the concept is never critically revised or considered in depth by people writing these papers, texts, uh, what we mean by creativity. There are, they, uh, they are uh, some definitions, but they are so generic. And it is assumption by, that we know all by default what it means. Uh, so, The one feature it, uh, doesn't vary. It does, the one uh, feature is unchangeable in all the de definitions. 
uh, it's always paired with innovation. So oh. it, it is always about novelty. Mm. Uh, we need to transform our reality or phenomena in it or um, the matter uh, into something completely new. And it is also taken by default. So behind that, behind that ge generic definitions uh, of what is called creative uh, and backed by a certain understanding, understanding of human, uh, so this is number one condition for development and economic thriving for, of all of us. No matter if we live in Africa or Papua New Guinea, if we are in Estonia or Indonesia or Sweden. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, my interest in all of that, uh, what happens to humans who historically are not in the areas or sphere of influence of this generic understanding and do not share this idea of creativity. For example, creativity is not novelty for them. And what is going on with societies or communities where people practice creativities in dramatically different way? Uh, and for instance, creativity for them is not something new, not innovation. Well, you might know that I am Natalia and I am an anthropologist, um, social, social and cultural anthropologist, unfortunately not a Christian anthropologist. So uh, for lately, for a few years, I'm busy with tracing ideas and com concepts which travel from global international organizations uh, to grassroots communities. And usually they do this via governmental administrations of the nation states. Uh, the concepts I have traced for a few years are creativity and innovation. My interest includes how these concepts are disseminated by international organizations, NGOs, and governmental offices, and how they are understood and perceived uh, at grassroots communities, in villages, nomadic camps, or small towns, particularly <coughs> in the area of Indian Himalaya, and precisely in Ladakh. Um, so I look into agency or impact of this dissemination of the generic idea of creativity, what it does to people, how it changes their lives, but much more important, their views or sense of self, mm -hmm. their system of values, and what they believe. And I should say, not without going into many details, I should say that transformation is dramatic. And uh, another important and interesting aspect of my, my work, I examine relations of creativity to mimesis or imitation, copying, mm. repetitions. Uh, because I also don't want to overload you by connections, how it is connected to the topic of creativity, but it is connected, especially in eyes of locals I'm communicating with. So, uh, and especially in the communities where people are still connected much tightly or much closer than in uh, urban Western society. So when I speak, when people ask me what I do, and I say all that, uh, amazingly repeated dialogue 
occurs from time to time. Oh, you know, I used to uh, teach a year in a Japanese, you can put <coughs> Singaporean, Chinese or Taiwanese school. And to, you know what? They have a very serious issue with creativity. What happened to them? Why? They listen in complete silence and they never ask questions. Mm. All right, it can be connected. Like yesterday, yeah, it was a very nice talk on that. Uh, it, it can be uh, connected uh, to the system of code of behavior in the hierarchy, code of behavior with a teacher, or just to your communication, I usually I think not pronouncing it aloud, or something else. Are you sure that it is connected to creativity? Yes, uh, because there are some other things um, uh, that uh, shows that uh, they don't have um, they don't have this curiosity or they don't want to know anything apart from what a teacher talks. Um, all right, those children uh, did they have gadgets? Yes. Did they use applications, different applications, or did they change platforms, or were they interested in new platforms? Oh yeah, they were absolutely busy with that, and they changed the platforms, and they exchanged, and so on. So were they active in that? Yes, very much active. So I felt here it is kind of um, very different agency, and very different uh, interest to different topics. and not maybe absence of interest towards is imposed to them on them. Uh, so in this story about schools and teachings in uh, those schools, I also find interesting how the description of children in terms of lacking something of in terms of insufficiency was transferred to the policies of development. Mm. Chil children like nations. First of all, they lack or they are insufficient and they lack something. We need to develop them. We need to help to develop, to develop them to develop. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we need to explain what is creativity and innovation. And since the main issue of development is lack of creativity and innovation, uh, we, should, we should explain how they should um, change themselves or transform themselves, obtain new traits or new features to uh, be more creative and innovative and uh, uh, learn how to survive in contemporary world. So I make it very flat and very simple, but something like that. Uh, Irina, I need again. <laughs> No. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I want what, to change. What do you want us to do with this? Um, Keep them for now. Uh, a bit of patience. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, one second. Uh, I want the that it would be presentation first of all. Uh, oh yeah, yes. Uh, uh -huh. And this mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And then you just roll. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is yeah. This is about. I, I like these lines because it's exactly uh, what is happening. Um, okay. It is the most, as I said, the most interesting <coughs> aspect of, uh, for me. How people start to view themselves in a completely different way when all that policies of uh, creativity and innovation come to places. Um, <coughs> so, uh, the ideas, who is pot potentially a cre creative human, uh, actually has, uh, they started long ago. And I am an institution who blames all the time liberalism and neoliberalism, and I am a, a bit, I, I have fatigue of scolding them, but actually I have to <laughs> 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 
<laughs> because actually, in a way, we had uh, here a bit opposite extreme. We were suffocated by states. So, uh, I think it sh people should negotiate. I think they should creatively find balance. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I have to uh, speak about those people who um, and. Uh, uh, I was afraid, and uh, Irina uh, told me not to overload you, so I took all the tables, data, names. I left Mr. Hume, <laughs> <laughs> lonely here. <laughs> but uh, we should thank him uh, for the most part of the generic understanding and a generic view of human. So, but I will go further. Uh, yeah, uh, all that legacy of um, liberals and actually uh, recreated by uh, neoliberalists with absolutely different agenda. Uh, yeah, they were researched quite a lot by anthropologists, and they mention them, especially in my institution, quite of often. Uh, I will not, as I promised, I will not overload you by names, but I want to mention maybe two na three names. Uh, first of all, uh, two anthropologists, both with the surname Leach, one of them James Leach, and another one Arthur Leach. So the first one, uh, uh, um, he said that actually if to look closely how human is seen in this uh, system of ideas, human is potentially criminal. Hmm. And this criminal human is very disturbing uh, and harmful creature if <coughs> he or she doesn't, doesn't create. So creativity doesn't is kind create. of... Doesn't he or she doesn't Create, create. Oh. then <coughs> danger. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so creativity is kind of uh, channeling our uh, own criminal nature into different, in a, in a more to a, to a more constructive um, direction. And uh, so. It was the basis to build the whole concept of creativity. New liberalists, uh, neoliberalists, sorry, uh, who have uh, who are adepts of uh, free market religion, uh, who uncritically believe into the existence and possibility of that completely free market. Uh, they think that the responsibility to survive in that free market is our own, is personal thing. So we need to adjust, we need to uh, adopt or develop ourselves. And it is not Foucauldian uh, kind of self-governance. It is a little bit further. I brought a book which you might saw. Actually, this book was given me by a uh, father, a priest, orthodox, an orthodox priest, uh, yeah, on creativity. Uh, nobody can pronounce this name. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what, how Americans read it, but uh, it is a well-known book, actually. Is it? Psychology Yeah, he's yeah. quite well known. He's mentioned. No, no, no American pronounces such names. Uh, he's practice. an American. <laughs> yes, I know. You use initials, uh, and then you uh, look scholarly. And All right. Don't <laughs> <laughs> and don't admit yeah. you can't pronounce the name. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he read Berdaev. I can see traces of some Berdaev ideas uh. there. But it, it is a long list of traits or features, character features, of a creative person. So he uh, spent years uh, to research creative people, the very well known, world wide known creative people, and actually distilled their traits, mm -hmm. the main traits. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So I, in that long list, I can see something what Berdyaev wrote about mm. uh, in uh, 1916. Yeah. So uh, James Leach, he names uh, this imposing of that ger generic ideas on people uh, all over the world and that promises uh, of thriving or economic <coughs> growth or well-being um, if uh, communities, all communities in the world adopt that understanding, mm -hmm. uh, neo-colonialism, ideological neo-colonialism. Yeah. He says that it is uh, not better than direct mm -hmm. neo-colonial uh, colonial time. Uh, so, in all that story, well, anthropologists are not heard much because they are economically are not somebody important. Well, the World Bank, um, I don't know how is it now, but uh, the head of World Bank a couple of years ago was an anthropologist, but mm -hmm. his research was connected to uh, mobile phones. Mm -hmm. uh, he is from South Korea. Yeah. So all that critiques, it is like bubbles in a way. Um, what is striking for me that we came to the point that uh, three new institutions by, uh, organized by the Wall Street, uh, they created coefficiency, a coefficient of creativity and innovation. So first came a coefficient of innovation. And all of us, including Papua New Guinea, Indonesia and Sweden, we became in one line in we are ranked all together. Mm -hmm. So when I speak that, uh, when I say that I am an anthropologist in Russian speaking environment, people think that I deal with, scal with scalps and bones, <laughs> usually. <laughs> yeah, and actually it was a very embarrassing page in certain kind of anthropology, very narrow, luckily, in the beginning, in the turn of the centuries, in the beginning of 20th century. So when, when some of them, uh, they measured people and people of physical features. So my question is, this measuring of creativity of people, which is connected by default to personal traits, how better is this? What, what makes it better? Uh, That's a good point. Yeah. So, and uh, all my research at one point became very apophatic. apophatic mm. yeah. mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, row, a number of negations mm -hmm. and nothing positive. <laughs> Complete critiques <laughs> from the beginning to end. Nothing cataphatic, <laughs> only apophatic, yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe it is, it, it is connected to orthodoxy, yes, but I'm not, I was not inspired to criticize and uh, to condemn and not to bring some uh, inspiring examples. Mm -hmm. So I started to search and uh, simultaneously I was invited for the first time to speak uh, in a group of theologians, I, and it was like shock for me. I was trembling. I had never spoken in front of priests, theologians, and so on. It happened in Prague. So I started to think, well, for me, Cappadocian fathers are especially very inspirational, personally, but they lived so long ago. <laughs> and if if we draw on something uh, closer to our contemporary ver world, on, if, if we uh, draw on people who had more or less similar issues and their world was a bit more looked like our 
Yeah, and of course, uh, I read Berdyaev long ago when I was very young. And my search for something positive led me, of course, to Berdyaev, uh, first of all to his book, but also to his correspondence. And I could not understand, because I, I remember in the 90s how harshly he was criticized, for example, in Russia. Uh, I think, well, I, I'm guilty because sometimes I go to websites where uh, fathers, uh, uh, church fathers, exercise in their uh, rhetorics and, yeah. And <coughs> Bir uh, Berdyaev is a criminal and his criminality leads to Cappadocian fathers. So since he inherited, actually, are, is connected, are connected to, uh, to authors whom he read most of all. And different assumptions that he was overwhelmed by, by occultic mystics. Uh, I think I missed one, he's reading the author, uh, an author you mentioned, yeah, but yeah. Actually, I wanted to put to place two mystics, he, occultic or uh, oh, more or less metaphysical people, yeah, can theosophical, can metaphysical. We, we don't, may, may not know uh, this you know. Uh, I can't so make. So, yeah. but yeah. mostly, mostly, I, even, uh, even. Um, huh? No, this is Stein. Huh? Steiner. Steiner. Ah, Steiner. Young Steiner. And then? Yeah, and this is what you were interested in. You told me you are interested in him. Uh, the mystic case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, actually the most borrowings even of metaf metaphorical comparisons or parables are Cappadocian fathers. And I could not understand that kind of harsh criticism and almost anger against him. And then I realized when I found his text, uh, not obscurity, obscur uh, um, obsc obscuralism, obscuralism. Uh, if you transform the word obscurity into the concept. Huh? Obscurantism. Obscurantism, thank you. Yes, and I understand why uh, it spark, uh, sparked so many emotions, because uh, he writes about that fetish of ignorance, mm -hmm. that any uh, knowledge <coughs> wider than prescribed uh, was seen even in his time as um, heresy, Cappadocian fathers were guilty, uh, and I didn't know because it, it is very much alive, this concept, this view is very much al alive now, but I didn't know that it was uh, rather strong in his time because he wrote about that, that uh, uh, actually guilt of Cappadocian fathers that uh, they read uh, all the classical Apollonistic uh, literature. Yeah, and uh, Plato, and etc. Et that they knew that. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, Berdyaev was guilty, and actually, so many, uh, so, so many um, attribute uh, people attribute to him uh, being obsessed with uh, occult or metaphysical stream of um, knowledge which is not true because he reads them very critically what he says and I, I will come to that what inspires him in uh, Steiner and there is uh, so um, this uh, he was a very well-known mystic which was uh, over occupied uh, by Kabbalah and you, it was the first name you gave me, uh, you told me, oh, I'm interested in that. Can you just uh, move the slide so that <laughs> to the... Uh, you can see it here, I, I don't know how to move them, that. Mm -hmm. If you pull the projector, it will help you. Uh, 
Ja. Jacob Ja. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> he reads them not not more. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, he refers to them not never more than to Nietzsche, to Dostoevsky, mm -hmm. to Pushkin. All the right guys. <laughs> to Saraf, uh, to Serafim of Saraf. Yeah. And uh, amazingly, he doesn't refer too much to those who influenced him the most. But uh, if you see his, the row of his met metaphors, you can uh, immediately recognize um, uh, Gregorius of Nyssa. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Maximus, uh, the confessor, mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. And he hardly refers to him. But yeah, mm -hmm. it is his biggest, according to you know, how I understand it, it was his big, uh, biggest uh, influence. Ah, he refers, yeah, he, he, he refers to him maybe once or twice. So, oh, sorry. Uh, what did you write? What did you write? Okay. Yeah, okay. what were the keywords? Which, for which one? Uh, for creativity, risk taking. Three things. Very contemporary. Divine and relational. Uh, uh, silence, uh, fear, and uh, time. Cool. Bright, courage, and fun. fun. Uh, rediscovering and seed of rituality. What is the second? Seed of rituality. Seed of? Rituality. Rituality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, mm. pretty much for me as well. So uh, uh, you read only who wants, yeah, Irina? Oh, okay, sorry, I'm playing the role of a seminar. A seminar. <laughs> 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 uh, I put freedom, play, and beauty. Yeah. But actually, interesting. Uh, before play, I, I put work, and then I crossed it. <laughs> 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 I wrote, I wrote, <laughs> we wrote imaging, uh, yeah. iconic, but we don't have an English word for that. Uh, think and wonder. Mm. Yeah. Uh, can you feel how different? If we write something spontaneously and fast, how yeah. different it is. And can you imagine uh, the difference between communities who are isolated from each other? Mm. Yeah? And what about human? Mother, father, child. <laughs> Reason, emotion, physical. Loving, creative, unhappy. I could actually, uh, it's the same. For both creative things, you know. oh. uh, new, free, and real. Thank you. Happy. Yeah, for me, uh, creativity was mediation, improvisation, connection. Uh, rediscovering, I would add. Um, <coughs> yeah, and what about your drawings? Did you enjoy at least? <laughs> to draw something. <laughs> I always something. enjoy drawing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, where creativity is? What What did you? Uh, uh, what is on your image? Don't think now. In Just the in the center of what your or being. home? Human being. Of your being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought it was noetic. It was the um, person inside my mind that transcends reason. It's um, the inner inner self. Consciousness, that. I don't know. The, the known unknown. I know it's there, but I don't know what it is. Mm. Yeah, and? I drew an image of a, 
person like this. I can't see with the arms up, standing with the arms up, Ooh, like nice. something yeah. Something outside themselves coming. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, for whom creativity is outside human or in between? Where is it? It's a, I draw a kind of like outside layer that it's mm -hmm. kind of a wrap, it's a human thing inside creativity. Oh, this is very, very interesting because uh, yeah, it is very much uh, engulfed in uh, uh, understanding. I will explain in a minute uh, what it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, understanding or the situation of creativity or the place where it exists or where it lives uh, has been so different. I will very briefly um, mention Max Weber. Uh, nobody remembers his um, argument and uh, arguments with a um, German philosopher, I don't remember his name, I never write him, who insisted that uh, creativity, really not well known, and uh, who insisted that creative is only human and all the nature and uh, all surroundings and all other beings cannot be creative. And what Max Weber uh, affirmed that um, actually the whole world is creative, that humans, humanity can be very mechanical, very automatic and uncreative mm -hmm. and uh, showed a lot of examples of that. Um, and the world can be very creative. Minerals, mm -hmm. planets, well, are the creatures when they change their uh, so a human uh, uh, sees other beings maybe uh, that they are determined all the time according to their instincts but um, yeah, they are creatures who, who change their behavior and so on uh, so uh, this uh, uh, this argument actually uh, was uh, has uh, had continuation, and uh, the most important, the most inspiring anthropologist uh, for young people, and uh, the reason why many young people found a place called Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland. Uh, so, thanks to the head of anthropological department, Tim Ingold, who first of all. Uh, he wrote first in our time uh, after a gap after Max Weber that uh, first of all there is no such thing as X factor in head or in human head. Uh, there is no such thing as absolutely isolated and um, entire creativity that uh, humans communicate, they exchange by ideas. A lot of ideas actually and a lot of concepts, they were created in communication and in arguments. And uh, secondly, he argues that for many humans in our world, they are not the center of universe, so they are not self-centered. And he brought a lot of examples of hunters, fisher, fishermen of the north who see the world dramatically different, different, uh, differently because they are, no, they are not in the center of creatures or of this universe. Yeah. Secondly, uh, his topic was uh, the communication of a monster to um, matter or material. That a lot of masters and artists, they go with the material. Not that they submit, but it is kind of, co of cooperation of a uh, master and material. So a, cop a carpenter or who carves, uh, who carves wood in an artistic way, um, yeah, uh, he or she might consider the shape of initial material uh, in creating something. And it was the whole body of the anthropology, a lot of young followers who wrote about that, on that, how um, creativity 
uh, emerges in communication, in the dialogue of a master and material. Um, third, he, and it is his, the strongest point and the most well known, uh, he made a very strong attempt to divorce creativity and innovation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said that it is back reading. That we always read back when we say that, oh, this is novelty, this is new, this is innovation. So, is it really <coughs> the best way to see the world, to do uh, back readings all the time? Uh, was his question, and uh, he brought a lot of examples and actually inspired the whole also stream of anthropology. When people researched imitation, copying, repetition as very creative act. Mm -hmm. I <coughs> told you a small story about my dialogues, uh, dialogues with people who used to teach particularly in Japan. So uh, Japan was kind of cliche in uh, bringing uh, an example of imitative nation or imitative country. That everything they created or all their creative practices actually in the root is imitation. So uh, anthropologists had to um, call a conference on Japan, because of that, where a lot of researchers, they showed uh, creativity as process, not a result, a process. Creativity in such a strict uh, performance like uh, calligraphy, it looks like repetition, imitation, or going after um, example but uh, they showed how much creativity in calligraphy and so on, in art, Japanese art and so on. So there was a, a book on Japan on that subject. So let's back, come back to Birdaev if Irina allows us. And yeah. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I will do. Yeah. So he writes passionately on the subject. I think he was so much concerned and so much inspired so by it. Berdyaev. Berdyaev. Nicholas or Nikolai Berdyaev. Um, he is not a man, for me, he is not human of this world. Because when revolution happened, he creates an institute of spirituality. It, uh, uh, he, and he creates it, uh, in, he creates it uh, in the time of Red Terror. And, of course, he was kicked out of the country with other 300 of philosophers and yeah, people in humanities, which were put on two ships and sent out in 1922. So, and his action, so he never compromises and he never submits. This is something fascinating. And he believes into that. He believes in freedom. So freedom is absolutely a um, necessary condition for any creativity. Again, uh, I just put his key words or phrases, what he thinks of that. He writes about duality of human, that uh, human is actually the intersection point of two worlds. And he criticized or he critically revised legacy of uh, fathers of church, including Cappadocian fathers, that not enough for him had been written on human as microcosm. And so that 
mainly the concentration of orthodox theology, the focus of orthodox theology was on Christology and on repentancy. And he actually, he explains also why, uh, considering the context of the time. But he uh, says that now we have time when uh, Christian anthropology is, uh, anthropology is absolutely necessary to go further and to confront the world actually where it goes. It was 1916 when he wrote it, still being in Russia. Um, and for him, Creativity is absolutely natural, and uh, if to remember the words he uses, that uh, it is, according to him, it is the gist of human, and at the same time it is a tribute of his nature. And uh, that uh, for him it is destiny of human, it is the way back to uh, human's creator, to the creator, and for him, it is equal to path of, uh, of uh, ascetic. I think it was very brave to, to say. And also, he condemns social sciences, by the way. Uh, and he writes ex extensively <coughs> in the same book on creativity about uh, positivism, about that attempts to be scientific, and it's very interesting to read because actually we <coughs> know that scene you know, of social sciences, yeah, that uh, social sciences, they pretend to be sciences and they um, want to justify own existence by being overly scientific. Yeah, and for me, it's, for, for me, this is, the credo, true life is creativity, not development. Uh, we can discuss further if somebody read him, but uh, I want to say just a couple of words about Florovsky and wrap it out. So, ah, yeah, another thing. Speaking about Berdyaev, uh, we need to remember what is uh, immanency, how it was understood in his time, and transcendency. Who can help me? Actually, immanency had already a very bad reputation in his time, mm -hmm. because the second, I especially uh, put two meanings of it mm -hmm. for you, because uh, these two were all the time confused. So those who actually uh, absolutely rejected that idea of uh, immanency, they actually referred to the second one, and which was quite popular in the beginning of 20th century, uh, with all that uh, flux of Zen Buddhism and so on, so on. Uh, and he says that both are very important uh, in understanding of human, but transcendency. Um, it was discussed and written a lot by orthodox theologists, and immanency, not enough for him. The Gregory of Nyssa is well known for writing on that. Uh, so, and Berdeyev says that the whole understanding of self, the whole behavior of human might change uh, if people accept that uh, immanency as the integrated part of uh, orthodox understanding of human. A, uh, very fast. Mm -hmm. Florovsky is a very, was very critical of Berdaev. And who, I, I didn't put any influences of Flor, uh, Florovsky, but it is mainly patristic literature, also Kopadokian fathers. And he is 
very accurate and very strict in following them. And uh, also, um, for certain, for a period of time, uh, Saint Sophroni, Father Sophroni of Essex, and their correspondence of that time is absolutely amazing reading. Uh, uh, so he criticizes Berdyaev. He thinks that uh, he was carried away by his two broad readings of metaphysic, occultic, and mystic literature. And he uh, thinks that uh, asceticism uh, cannot be replaced by creativity and cannot be like on the side of creativity, that asc asceticism is absolutely um, necessary condition for creativity. So creativity comes from asceticism, but uh, asceticism not necessarily lead to creativity. And he brings a lot of uh, examples. So, What else I wanted to say? Uh, I wanted to say that his view, amazingly, very close to the views of people with whom I try to do collaborative anthropology. I hate to see people as objects of research, and I'm trying hard. It is always a challenge, but I'm, I'm trying uh, hard to do uh, collaborative anthropology. So people in Lodak, they say, and I know from their writings, that to be, uh, and for them, creativity is also improvisation going away from ready samples of uh, going away uh, uh, from repeating a teacher, a profound teacher, good teacher. And what they say, it is a kind of Tibetan-like culture within India, yeah? So mm. they are very different from most of Indian uh, ethnicities, and they were influenced by whoever, Kashmir is uh, Iran, Tibetans, most of all, in terms of the language. So uh, they say uh, to improvise, and creativity is improvisation for them. Um, same as Ampo Goresa, the mind or soul, they sometimes use English word soul, should be noble. Then it will not harm. All other creativity just destroys and harms. Uh, and I tried to ask, OK, uh, can you bring the local example? Uh, because all the examples were from the world, from our contemporary world, from the politics and from wars and so on. And I asked them, um, can you bring any local example when what kind of creativity or improvisation would harm? And they said, for instance, um, when people work on fields uh, without understanding invisible world around us, and we do live in together side by side with invisible creatures, they try to transform or to dictate those invisible creatures what they think is useful for them. And it might harm because very well-educated and noble mind can do that and change, for example, a landscape in terms of uh, conducting of uh, invisible creatures. So uh, I think I need to conclude that I'm not against any ideas. I'm not against civilization. I'm using it a lot, and development as well. And actually, I um, restrain from criticizing like uh, without, without any consideration all the liberal thoughts or even neoliberalists. Maybe they send something useful. Well, uh, their faith and religion into um, faith into free market is one thing. It is. Uh, a bit cocky for me, and because it doesn't exist, 
um, as far as I know. But actually, generally, uh, I think that they say something maybe what we need to hear. Yeah, but I am against replacing all ideas of creativity by one. Yes, yes. I am against that erosion. I'm against measuring creativities. And I would say that we, in this world, we have creativities rather than creativity. Thank you. <laughs> and I want to hear you. <coughs> so, I, this was very splendid. I, this is what we're trying to do at our school, and I tried to express a bit yesterday uh, this avoidance of tyranny and staying in a place of wonder uh, between ideas. And uh, I think there is an epistemological colonialism that is at the heart of much of what you're saying. And so I wondered if you would comment on that. Uh, and then second, uh, I am now very afraid because I started uh, with St. Basil and history and traced uh, this as an uh, orthodox way of being to stand in tension uh, with ideas and all ideas uh, and uh, the truth and to avoid tyranny of thought and it uh, now I must wonder if we have become controversial uh, by doing that uh, because it seems uh, truly orthodox to do this beginning with the Cappadocian fathers mm -hmm. and moving forward so I, I wondered if you comment on both things uh, are we right we worry about uh, a kind of epistemological colonialism and, and staying in wonder and tension. Uh, is there something to that? And then secondly, uh, why would this be so controversial when you can see dialogue with paganism? Uh, Homer was continuously read mm -hmm. by the Orthodox. Uh, if you would comment on both things. Uh, well, uh, pity that there are no fathers here, that it would be, <laughs> that would be <laughs> legitimate to, to comment on that. But I would refer to Berdeev again. Right. Uh, I, he doesn't uh, write about that very clearly. But I can read in between lines that if we accept a bit dangerous idea, because it was already a lot of speculations in his time on that, that the, the God's kingdom is imminent, at least to some parts of this world, that we can, then we can uh, learn from many other streams of ideas, yeah. taken critically, approaching them yes. very carefully, critically, and taking what we think is very like constructive, like he took from the occultic writers. The, uh, he says he, he never accepted them as own teachers of something, but right. he wrote that um, occult, occultists, occultic writers, authors, or these mystics of, uh, starting from 17th century and 19th century, they saw human like as microcosm, mm -hmm. and he saw that imminency or imminent uh, uh, imminent part of human. They acknowledged that, and this what he sees positive mm -hmm. in those um, authors. Yeah. Uh, what was the other one? The, yeah, Epi colonial, uh, epi yeah, epistemological colonialism. I, I only mm. say to what you just said, the idea of microcosm uh, be, is so central to Plato's Timaeus, mm -hmm. which was the only scientific text in both the west of the world and much mm -hmm. of the east of Christian world. It's impossible to think about uh, much of our thought without that. So. Actually, uh, Berdeev doesn't uh, mention them because it, uh, I think he was already accused of being neoplatonic. Oh. I suspect that because it was very much discussed in his time. And he is accused now to be a follower uh, yeah, of neoplatonism. So he prefers to uh, refer to the this occultic head. 
<laughs> to different authors. But um, if if to take his idea, why not to take something what could help? Yeah. And why to have a fresh eye on that? Why to like to have fear? He writes a lot about fear that actually the result, the side effect of all that um, all that tendency or emphasis yeah, uh, was the fear which practically, literally, uh, when uh, people literally take all the legacy of uh, church fathers had to say of the patristic uh, literature, yeah, that uh, in common people it just developed fear. Mm. So he, uh, he wrote about that, and I think that we need critically revise what he wrote and critically approach his writings, but actually it sounds for me, I heard it from my childhood what he wrote, mm. actually. Maybe I was already affected by heresy uh, to, yeah, to sympathize with his thinking, but I think it, it is very balanced if uh, to read attentively his text and not to, uh, with, without bias, or not attribute to him what he didn't think and didn't write. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I, I'm just making a comment about the, the context, because Pirtev comes from the um, uh, intellectual um, group, group of intellectuals who have uh, converted from materialism to, yes. to idealism yeah. as a result yes. of the uh, revolution of 1905 when they faced uh, this outbreak of violence and uh, they were disillusioned in uh, uh, socialist and you know, Marxist ideas. Uh, I mean, Bertev wasn't so much, but like... No, Bukakov, he wasn't. Bukakov and others, but he was part of this Vehi, uh, the, the journal they published uh, called Vehi, and uh, they were really uh, searching for answers yes. uh, to uh, their time and uh, so we, we have to understand him and he was absolutely uh, um, like contemporary to other intellectuals of, of, of you know European intellectuals when he emigrated to Paris he was one of the Russians who wasn't so isolated in this kind of you know orthodox you know uh, cultural kind of ghetto. Mm -hmm. He was a friend of Maritain, you know, like uh, Raisa Maritain was Russian, so they, they had really good relations, like, I mean, they, they, they met a lot, and he was very um, well connected with this uh, neo Thomist uh, uh, revival in France. So I'm kind of, I'm not specialist, but I'm searching for some kind of connections, and because the neo Thomists were asking similar questions, weren't they? Because they were trying to go back to the roots, to the yes. medieval philosophy, yes. uh, but in a kind of uh, different way than, for example, Florovsky was doing it. So I'm just throwing this because I think what, what you've uh, uh, actually just uh, uh, showed us is this, this dialogue taking place between two very important uh, intellectuals uh, uh, is very, um, uh, how to say, uh, very telling because that's that's what was uh, happening in, uh, in in this period between the wars and then after that they, they were actually facing modernity facing the world was changing they had to really find uh, orthodoxy was very important for them okay but death is often regarded as a kind of uh, uh, you know more like a this um, bohemian figure rather than orthodox but he was he was a believer he was you know uh, he was a really orthodox passionate and, believer, uh, yeah. uh, so we cannot deny that and uh, i mean like everybody went through this stage of you know cult and you know, this this is people were you know searching but <laughs> somehow those of them who were um, um, expelled from russia let's say you know, the, and then became part of this uh, uh, you know, Russian emigre uh, uh, kind of revival, you know, in, in the West, which influenced a lot, you know, modern Orthodox theology. Uh, 
So I mean, I feel Berdyaev was kind of un unfairly forgotten in, in that stream. So in a way, I feel that what you do is kind of right because we, we have to uh, go back maybe reread him. Yes. If I could just follow up uh, on that. Uh, he was sidelined for a couple of reasons. One of them was in the West, that philosophy just was misplaced at that time. It was mm -hmm. just not corresponding to anything that was that was uh, developing. So, and, and there is uh, this renewed interest in that in the West is mm -hmm. quite yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. It goes back no more than, well, I mean, if you're generous, you can say 25 years, but actually over the last 10 years or so, there is more and more is Western okay. scholars who are just interested, mm -hmm. not, not just Orthodox, but in his thought. And I think it corresponds now with this kind of uh, post-secular mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of, uh, of environment. <coughs> but his philosophy was, uh, really uh, strangely positioned there. He addresses things in a way from this religious perspective, which is not really cool, and is not really cool even nowadays. Uh, for Orthodox, there are all sorts of these ridiculous uh, accusations. And one of them that I never understood was the accusation of, of Platonism. I mean, where, where do you find Platonism? In Berjai, I would like to, it's just misreading and misreading, but it, it's just, he's actually very explicit about it. Uh, and, uh, and the reason why he absolutely rejects Platonism is that Platonic, what seems to be transcendental in Platonism is actually, from Berjai's perspective, even. Uh, and, and that's the thing, because uh, ideas, uh, what use, or what use are ideas if they are still part of, of the world that exists? My only quibble, I will quibble, mm -hmm. uh, that much of what is called Platonism uh, by the church is Neoplatonism, and I would argue isn't found in the works of Plato at all, mm -hmm. which exactly. is much uh, more skeptical and much less doctrinaire and much more microcosm within the person and much less critical of C. Timaeus, the ensoulment of bodies and of bodies. Uh, Plotinus is in Plato. Mm. And sure. Uh, and that, that gave rise to this whole uh, spirit matter dualism. But even if you go back to Plato, uh, there are reasons why, I think, and, and, and my understanding is they're based on that I, why Plato even original Plato, Actually, it's extremely it's, uh, difficult to reconcile, I would say impossible to reconcile with Christian. I, 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 I want just uh, to, to comment on that, uh, because he writes in his different work uh, that actually um, uh, the microcosm, some scare lines of seeing human as microcosm by uh, Maximus the Confessor, mm -hmm. inspired him. Who's also a Platonist, right? <laughs> well, uh, but he... In the, in the sense that I want Why? to say that I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to say that I'm a Platonist, but only if you don't allow Neoplatonism to obscure uh, and say something foolish like the body is evil and heretical. But I don't see Plato saying that. But I don't want to defend that now or distract. I just want to say, uh, just as Platonism is a very big word, and, and that's what I do. I think about Plato. Uh, it's maybe the only thing I should think about. But I, I wouldn't want something to be condemned. Platonism is so big, and it became so diverse, that it could just mean radical skepticism. There are whole schools of Platonic thought that are radically skeptical. I, I reject that form of Platonism. There are uh, schools of thought that are utterly the body is evil. I reject that school of Platonism. Uh, so I think it's a complex thing to say someone rejects or accepts Platonism when it spawned, there's so many ideas that spawn so many good ideas uh, and are transformed in someone like Maximus. I'm sorry if I sound like I'm defending Plato. No, 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 no. <laughs> because I want to be critical of him too, right? Yeah, no, right. We're Christians, right. not. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> if we just connect with what uh, Natalia was, you know, the point she was trying to make about right. this, uh, you know, creativity can, shouldn't be identified with the innovation and, uh, and development and this kind of something that, you know, there is like a kind of blueprint of, you know, what we develop, you know, the creative people and creative nations should be like and then, yes. you know, like we expect others. Kind of so, 
how would this, like, uh, you know, how would Plato <laughs> respond oh, to that? <laughs> well, I, I will try to just be a Christian and respond to it. Uh, I loved what you said. It seems to me I was interacting with someone uh, on the internet recently, and they were describing every nation that wasn't neoliberal as undeveloped and uncultured. And I said, uh, here's an idea. Instead of thinking of one philosophy replacing another, because they had a view of history where the dialectic worked to replace one philosophy with another, what if we enriched? What if we developed in the sense of uh, organic growth of human things and uh, that there was a diversity of expression of that? Even within Orthodox Christianity, where Romania is not like Estonia, which is not like Russia, and this was they rejected this altogether as meaningless. So I would say uh, that my view is I, I hope it I thought it resonated with what you're saying, and that it's less replacement, like development isn't a series of first we thought this primitive thing, now we think this, tomorrow we think this, until we get to Star Trek, right? We're on the uh, Enterprise boldly going and colonizing planets with our, our ideas. Uh, instead, it's a flowering, an organic yeah. flowering yeah. Uh, of becoming more human. Yeah, I, 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 I can see the connection <laughs> a little bit, uh, just so I can offer a comment around the creativity as a process and what John Mark is um, putting forward as an epistemology of um, dialectic education yeah. as... Um, being able to stand in tension with ideas and to avoid tyranny of thought. So to create this educational environment where thought can be seen as a process, a creative per process that can be explored, that, um, as you say, like something can um, evolve organically, that ideas can be held in tension. And I, I want to kind of affirm that as something that I truly believe is so uh, important for this age, um, because we see like everywhere the erosion of, uh, well, certainly from the context I come from in Great Britain, the erosion of freedom of, spree freedom of speech. Yes. We see also um, in Britain a, a, a sort of re-emergence of this interest in George Orwell. And I think it's as a result mm -hmm. of um, what has happened is the extreme left are becoming totalitarian around some aspect of how language is used and there's a psychologist in Canada I can't remember his name who's he's actually spoken openly about this and he's tried to open dialogue um, as a psychologist around actually how uh, meaning is constructed you know we say mean we say a psychologist language informs meaning this is something I talk to students about all the time you know social constructionism how we construct our reality is 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 very much related to the language that we use and I think to have an educational environment where freedom of speech is, is preserved, this epistemological approach that you put forward in terms of being able to hold ideas in tension, mm -hmm. and if we can view that as a creative process, yes. this is so what's needed now in this, this yeah. time. Rather than silence. Rather it's than silence. Rather yeah, than kind it's of closing down dialogue. We need to, as Christians, we need to mm -hmm. somehow, uh, you know, support this uh, approach that we can hold ideas exactly. in tension, that we can live with um, tension, that we can be brave, because we know the deep, you know, that, like you said, if we know where the truth is, we, we can, we have the security to live with uh, uncertainty. That's what it's about for me. Uh, uh, sorry, f forgive me, I talk uh, too much. But uh, no, 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 you no. almost cited Berdaev actually on that topic. Yeah, why I, never, I actually I've never referred. Read I've never read Berdaev. So. Yeah, 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 no, I mean, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it, it was his view, exactly, because uh, he used a different ver uh, word which I, I cannot reproduce in English exactly, but it is uh, basically dichotomy. And he uh, writes, uh, who said that dichotomy is bad? Right. And uh, I would not reject or I would not go over it because there is need to go over it somehow, yeah, logically or analytically. I would live over it by my Christian life. And it's something really striking for me. What a wonderful session.
No, 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 no. I think I just have to send Miriam to 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 the bus station at some point, but she has a bit of time. Yes. So yeah, maybe like quarter past five, five. But it's okay. We can continue. I sorry before you say because I will forget exactly. Yeah, you know who inspired me a lot of seeing the world or seeing different civilizations and people and ethnicities like as a well. Uh, fathers of Beijing mission of the Russian Orthodox Church of 19th century. Mm. And you can't imagine what kind of struggles they ha had to go through. Being uh, in a Soviet university as an undergraduate student in St. Petersburg, uh, uh, we read a textbook written by a monk uh, Joachim, Father Joachim Bichurin, and actually they condemned the, it was a big introduction how bad he was, <laughs> but actually they couldn't repla replace the textbook. <laughs> and I was so proud sitting in the wow, we, we, yeah, we are using a monk's <laughs> writings. Uh, so uh, he is also a very legendary, mystical uh, person who was uh, accused of everything, <laughs> everything, literally. Yeah, but he um, educated a group of monks also and uh, future leaders of the same Beijing mission who actually show us examples of absolutely different approach and it was very innovative approach in that time because the monks didn't read anthropologists or boas, for instance. Yeah, and uh, everything what was written on the topic came later, but uh, in the second half of 19th century, they already saw the world like that. Sorry, yes, no, please. I hope you didn't forget. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say something to defend the left uh, in, in this context. Uh, the extreme left. Uh, well, uh, that's, that's precisely what I would like to comment because I don't see anything actually leftist in what, what nowadays is called extreme left. I actually think it's a just another variation of extremely oppressive right-wing mm -hmm. ideology that actually, uh, because the focus that I don't see what is leftist about uh, the affirmation of hatred among people, or what is uh, leftist about cultivation of elite uh, closed circles in which uh, the defense of, of, uh, of these ideas and uh, cultural political correctness is promoted. What is leftist about, you know, despising the rest of the world? What is leftist about the witch hunts? That's it. You know, it's just like I think it's very, it's, it's actually that, that we should, in a way, revive uh, the leftist ideas. And, and my understanding of, of them, because uh, the left, authentic left, uh, has almost disappeared. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you tell me one European state where there is a meaningful left that has any influence of the political process. I mean, Syriza was an attempt, but we saw uh, how it ended. So there's absolutely no left, because left is either there is right-wing extremism in the sense of nationalism, or the right-wing uh, extremism in along the lines of, of neoliberalism, which is associated itself with uh, international big businesses. But it's just not left. Uh, and in any sense, and Berjain was actually leftist. Uh, when he talks about he was a socialist, uh, he was even anarchist, actually. Yeah, yeah really. He's, he's uh, uh, the realm of Caesar and the realm of spirit. When he actually, uh, when he talks about it, the only reason why he was not consciously accepting, he says, why I don't accept uh, anarchism is because of those who call themselves anarchists. Yeah, yeah. What they do, but actually my ideas are, he, he uses even these concepts <coughs> like eschatological anarchism. So I think uh, it's, uh, it's in a way important to uh, advance, I think, left along the lines of recognition of uh, our basic uh, human identity that uh, transgresses uh, all these uh, national or ethnic boundaries and I think that's pretty much also under attack, also in political correctness. I'm, I'm curious, we were about to respond. Yeah, because um, I would understand if he criticized socialist and uh, Marxist ideas after immigration being like <laughs> exiled from the country this way, but he writes about that in his book on creativity in uh, 1916, mm -hmm. 
in this um, meaning of creative act. And he refers to Marxist ideas and he criti re very critically. But Marx is a right wing deviation of the left. Mm. Yeah, Berger was very <laughs> aware of that. Marxism is just not what classical so left. I, I, feel, <coughs> I feel that. Um, I now I will say a controversial thing. Yeah. I, I feel that I don't want to be controlled by a vocabulary based on essentially a period of the French Revolution where exactly. we the assembly into left and right. And if a description exactly. of human mm -hmm. rights mm -hmm. uh, that I think you can derive from uh, Hebrew scriptures is left wing, I, I no longer know what that means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we. So let me. Let, what if we abandoned the term left and simply hated tyranny? A good uh, exactly. term, by the way, from the Republic, yeah, where we hate uh, the tyrant of Book Nine, the great drone that destroys all thought. Yeah, that's much uh, better. And yeah. so, uh, death to tyrants. That's what I was, uh, that's what I was However, they describe themselves. To, yeah. yeah, and that's what I call anarchy. The okay. principle, yeah. principle stands against power structures, no matter how they manifest themselves. And that's when you read Bakunin, that's exactly how she says Marx. Because Bakun is so immediately that if we opt for a statist alternative, it will end up in statist oppression, and that's exactly what the left. Can you repeat stands. that again? Sorry, I didn't hear the. Sorry, <coughs> uh, that was exactly at the core of Bakunin's uh, critique of Marx. I'm not familiar with the. the, the Bakunin, Bakunin, Bakunin um, uh, one of the greatest the anarchists, uh, 19th century. Okay, forgive thinkers. me, I am no, 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 it's, I'm uh, a historian. So. It's, uh, uh, so his his position was he he attacked, and that was big divide on the left in. In, in the 19th century, where he criticized the Marxist position uh, against uh, strong state, because he realized that if we go that way, we will end up in an authoritarian state system, and that's what the left should uh, uh, be against. So that is the, the alternative anarchist alternative, and the reason why anarchism is just not so we always like, oh my God, you know, what is anarchist? Because precisely that position, that is authentic left, I think. And, mm -hmm. and, and that has been under attack from both sides mm -hmm. because nobody really liked it. Capitalist statists in the West didn't like it because that was against everything what they stood for. In the East, statists, uh, again, left communist in quotation marks, didn't like it because that was attack on their power. Uh, and using state actually to oppress uh, yeah. everybody. Who didn't um, it's like interesting because it. I think what, what we see in the UK now is people losing their jobs over um, a certain um, sentiment that yeah. they um, express, and this is now uh, reaching a point of political crisis because uh, now uh, people now actually are self um, self. What's the word I'm looking for? Censoring. Self censoring. Thank mm -hmm. you. They're self censoring mm -hmm. because of fear. Absolutely. And this now is creating. This is the opposite of condition we want for education for children. Absolutely. Can you imagine a classroom where children self-censor actually, you know, what we want is children to take risks, to express themselves, everything we know from Vygotsky and Bruno's yeah. like we want language in the classroom, yeah, we want yeah. to talk, we want to debate. So how, as educators, this is very important, like what's happening on the macro context? You know, is this going to come down into our classrooms or we go to, uh, the other way, do you know what I mean? Like how we create this environment shapes mm -hmm. the society that we then come to live in. So these things are very interrelated, um, and I was very interested. I'm, I'm curious. I'm very curious. Recently, um, the I d I'm just forgive me, just expressing no, just the context. In very interesting. Head. Yeah. What I saw recently is the um, British government put advert out for um, actually recruiting. They, I mean, uh, it's not politically correct to say it, but I'll just say what it said. It said advert for weirdos, uh, free thinkers, and um, you know essentially like people who are a bit weirdo in their thinking. That's like they advertise job like this. And oh. immediate response from the public, you know, because somebody's already given some statement, like some allusion to <coughs> eugenics, people saying this person has to go out of the cabinet, and the government didn't respond. And I sat back and observed this, and I thought, this is very interesting. Have the government intentionally done this? Because they're trying to open up a landscape where actually we can tolerate... Um, some, you know, we have to le learn to say, okay, I don't agree with you fully, but I'm not going to fire you Absolutely. because we have to change this climate. Because if we end up firing everybody who says something different, Absolutely. what kind of landscape are we creating? So I'm thinking, 
actually have they done this intentionally to try and open up some kind of new tolerance to um, I don't know, I'm curious, I'm just very curious why the government had done this literally two weeks ago. So I, I don't know the answer, but it's interesting. So that they know who they are, so that they can act on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 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 identify yourself. <laughs> <laughs> apply free <Thank> thinkers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you, you get your one-way so tickets to go. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Do you, do you think that if we applied the same um, critical tension uh, between these two great thinkers that you ended with, uh, I'm tempted, uh, perhaps because I know too little about both, to see more commonality than difference. Mm -hmm. That the fight was so fierce because they began with a very similar place uh, and lived in exile uh, in one way impotently uh, what is it Chesterton says? Academics fight uh, so hard because they're fighting over so little. Uh, and are they as dissimilar as one would believe? Because I think looked at from a secular point of view, they would look very similar. First of all, we need to remember that uh, Florovsky was a priest. Right. And it matters. It makes difference between them, because for Florovsky it's serious. Uh, secondly, well, there are similarities even when they discuss asceticism. <coughs> even like on uh, in the first glance, uh, Berdyaev was saying that uh, asceticism is one of pathos, and another one is creativity which demands a lot of sacrifice. And it is a heroic life, a life of cre creative life. And he doesn't mean then artists or writers. He writes also about creativity of philosophy, creativity of ideas, and creativity of life itself. But when you read the description, how much sacrifice uh, should be brought on on the on the way of creativity, then actually their writings are not so different. It doesn't make it so different. Well, uh, Florovsky is precise about asceticism. He writes about um, uh, believers, about monks, about uh, monastic asceticism. But actually, at the end, both write about sacrifice about that you cannot lead common life and be create, really, truly creative. Mm. Mm. That's so interesting. maybe we should to wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, what was interesting? Can so. you tell me what was interesting out of everything? Um, I now have to read a lot. <laughs> 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 It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful um, series of thoughts. And uh, in the United States, to meet an anthropologist who is willing to not be a materialist about everything is, is to like meet a unicorn. So in some ways, the talk was beautiful by itself to me, uh, like finding water. Uh, really, seriously, anthropology. I'm not sure that I, could you give this talk at an American university? Uh, very freely, yes. Uh, much easier than in London. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> or We're here. So no, here I would give. I, I would give openly the talk in Tallinn University. Yes, because actually I never uh, living here. I never. It was not a secret that I'm a believer, and it was very cocky because yeah. Uh, actually, anthropologist equals atheist. Uh, right, but in the United uh, very States often. too, right? Uh, when you had to hire anthropologists at a Christian university, it was very difficult to find any believer of any kind. So, thank you anyway. <laughs> there is a um, father, Orthodox father, by the way. He's an American and uh, he is serving in France and he belongs to Moscow Patriarchate. As interesting as it sounds, 
Yeah, and he is a retired anthropologist. He had uh, been an, an anthropologist all his working life, mm. writing, publishing a lot on Indonesia, on the Indonesian rituals, masks, and so on. And uh, he's, now he's an Orthodox priest, and it didn't happen, so he was a believer all his life. Beautiful. Yeah, and uh, what uh, he's a uh, very much American for me in a sense that when where people in the places or uh, in cases where people hesitate and don't know how to pro approach um, phenomena topic or just go uh, follow on wish, he's just doing that. Mm -hmm. He because for me it was a dream, idealistic dream to somehow connect uh, social, cultural anthropology and Christian anthropology. So it happened like beyond my will, it just happened. I, I, yeah, I was invited. But he has been doing that mm. without hesitation and he is not uh, uh, caring or he's not worrying too much about the result. He knows that it might be clumsy in the beginning. But I like to read his writings because it is very creative, very creative combination. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, you agree that.